Hi, uh, I'll just do a short intro. This is Deep Learning Classics and Trends. We are today having Sorab um, telling us about RLS Bench. It's a benchmarking data set uh, for distribution shift or label shift in the application of domain adaptation. I'm really excited to hear about it. Yeah, so thanks Rosanne, for inviting me. Uh, I'm excited to be talking about this recent work, which we will be actually presenting in a couple of days at ICML. So yeah, for folks who are more interested in like having more discussions, and if you happen to attend ICML, please drop by our poster or feel free to uh, message me. Okay, so in this talk, uh, I'll sort of broadly center and discuss about like domain adaptation under relaxed table shifts, but there will be sort of tits bits here and there that I'll sort of try to connect with the problem and then discuss the problem of domain adaptation a bit more broadly. So let's get started. Uh, so uh, I don't think this crowd would need this introduction, but recently we've seen sort of a huge success in machine learning starting from like this ImageNet movement. And now we have like uh, <clears throat> deep learning sort of scale to charting systems or like generative sort of models where we have very good generative models that can probably like generate human-like uh, content on the internet. And, and, and starting from like this ImageNet movement, <clears throat> it has sort of inspired application in like scientific domains. For example, applications in medical domain where people have tried to use deep learning to sort of solve some medical AI task. For example, trying to sort of interpret medical imagery and things like that. And just after sort of ResNets came out, people tried to sort of deploy these, these, these architectures on like medical problems. For example, in dermatology, people realized that actually uh, we can get some good in distribution performance by directly deploying like uh, ImageNet train models and stuff like that. And that has led to like more interest into like medical retinopathy and, and, and things like that. However, the story is a bit more pessimistic when it comes to actually deploying these models in the wild. So when practitioners started actually deploying these models in the wild, they realized that these models often face distribution shift problems and they sort of start to break in the sense that they don't continue to up achieve the superior performance that they otherwise get on their in-distribution data. So when people were trying to sort of deploy these models on like COVID medical imaging, they realized that they're often close to like random performance or even worse than that. And there have been prior works that tried to sort of distill and like, like discuss why these things happen and primary reasons are latching onto spurious correlations, your distributions of, of your camera and things like that sort of shifting and, and, and your models don't really, uh, generalized to those. Um, and, 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 and there have been like quite a few surveys sort of discussing that none of the techniques that people thought and people sort of tried from, uh, from IID settings uh, didn't sort of port over to like, like COVID-19 chest radiographs or, or things like that. So that sort of brings us to this problem of like, okay, machine learning while being very good, it's still not like very robust to distribution shift problems specifically in like scientific applications, for example, medical or like satellite imaging. By the way, just one thing, I think this is more like an interactive talk. So please feel free to stop me at any point if there is any question or if there is any like, uh, um, yeah, or if there's anything unclear in the slides. Okay, so, so this distribution shift problem can sort of appear in, in different learning scenarios. Uh, I have listed sort of three of the learning scenarios here in no way they're exhaustive but they sort of represent the common learning paradigms that people usually use. So one is this domain generalization setup where we are given label data from multiple related training domains. And the goal is to generalize to a previously unseen but related domain. Then there is this setting of transfer learning where we have labeled data from a source domain, like from a domain where we have a large amount of labeled data. And then we have small amount of labeled data from the target domain or the test domain of interest. And the hope is that we'll train a lot, like a model on, on that large labeled data and then sort of fine tune it on small portion of the interest, like the test data. And then there is this problem of domain adaptation where we have access to labeled training data and unlabeled test data. And the goal is to generalize to this test domain without seeing any labels from that. And at a high level, these settings sort of differ in what data we have available during training and adaptation. Sorry, I think there is some. Uh... Uh, can I ask a question? So what is yes. that different from between domain generalization to domain adaptation? 
Yeah, so typically in domain generalization, we don't have any access to unlabeled data from the domain of interest. So for example, let's say I have four domains from which I see labeled data, and I want to generalize to a fifth domain for which I have no information. What I know is it's related to these domains and that's it. Hmm. While in domain adaptation, we may only have labeled data from let's say one domain, but we have unlabeled data from the test domain, the target domain of interest. So that unlabeled data can hope to sort of provide more information about where you want to deploy your models. I see. Um, another question is when we talk about different domains, like how different are we talking about? Let's say- Exactly, let's come to that. Let's come to that. So that will be like the major part of the talk. Yeah, let's come to that. Okay. Uh, okay, so at a high level, these settings sort of differ in like what kind of data we have available during training and adaptation. Uh, and in this book, we'll focus mostly on like unsupervised domain adaptation problems where we'll have uh, labeled and unlabeled data. So let me first describe the setup a bit more formally. <clears throat> so here we have um, labeled source data, uh, uh, which can be from, from let's say some, some training domain. And there is sort of some distribution shift happening when we are deploying these models in the wild. So we have test distribution from which we have access to unlabeled data. And as I mentioned before, the goal here is to predict well on test distribution without seeing any labels from that distribution. So I hope the problem at least makes sense. And now we'll clarify on what do we mean by distribution shift and how the distributions can actually shift and like what makes problem a bit less hopeless. Uh, but yeah, uh, if there is any question at this point about the setup, uh, please oh. let me know. Yes, I have a question. So do we have data from the source distribution or just a model yes. screen from that? No, we have labeled data. No, so we are imagining we are not really in a, yeah, we have labeled data. So mm -hmm. if you want to use it again for adaptation, we are, we are, yeah, it's okay to do that. But the model is also trained from that data. Yes, so you can train a model that has already been trained on source data and then fine tune it on whatever unlabeled data you have, or you can train from scratch. Imagine I give you this pair, Mm -hmm. And we are interested in training a model on this labeled and unlabeled data together with a goal of maximizing performance on your unlabeled counterpart. Right. Okay. Oh, we have, <clears throat> another, we have a raised hand as well from Argafel. Okay. Yeah, just yeah please. To, yeah, just wanted to check, but then uh, they will be from this, are they from a different domain in this case? Yeah, so the source distribution is from different uh, domain than the target distribution. Yes, yes. And I'll clarify how the distributions can actually shift in the next slide. Okay. Yeah, these are great questions. Thanks. So, um, okay. So in this talk, we'll mainly consider about, like we'll mainly consider distribution shift problems where the distribution shift is primarily arising due to changing class prevalences. And I'll make it clear what do I mean by that. So consider an archetype example of disease diagnosis. Let's say we have patient records, which in some sense are labeled examples from hospital one on, on let's say um, this disease diagnosis problem where we have to predict pneumonia, tuberculosis or asthma. So what we can do, we can sort of hope to trade a model by simply sort of uh, trying, by simply using like a, like a uh, supervised learning empirical risk minimization paradigm to get a model. And let's say these were the class prevalences that I'm showing on the right. So we have prevalence of asthma is like 0.1, prevalence of TB in that training data is approximately 0.6, and prevalence of pneumonia is approximately 0.3. Now, let's say a practitioner takes this model and deploys it in different locality where prevalence of these diseases are different. So now, with the goal of that practitioner is to actually take unlabeled data from hospital two and actually make good predictions or like correct predictions. However, by changing class prevalence, because we have sort of these class prevalences changed from hospital one to hospital two, it's unclear whether a model that did well on holdout data from hospital one will continue to do well on holdout data from hospital two. And note that when we only have unlabeled data from target, it becomes unclear whether we can sort of continue to trust these models prediction when the distribution has shifted in this manner. <clears throat> so that's sort of a high level sort of problem that we are sort of dealing with. 
where we have labeled data from hospital one, unlabeled data from hospital two, and the class prevalence is sort of shifted. And we don't know how they shifted because we don't have labels from hospital two. Okay. Uh, yeah, if there's any question about the setup uh, or like this, this example, please uh, let me know. Okay, so so let's characterize this setting under under this classical setting of label shift. So under label shift, we have this assumption that the label proportions py can change from source to target or training to test. So I'll use these words interchangeably, where source means training and target is test. But the conditional p of x given y doesn't change. So intuitively, what this implies is that the way in which different images look conditional on your class label doesn't really change from source to target. So this is the simplistic setting, uh, which is known as label shift in the literature. And under this label shift setting, with some minor additional assumptions, the problem of domain adaptation is provably tackleable in the sense that <laughs> under some additional benign assumptions, having labeled source data and unlabeled target data is sort of enough to, to give like, like an optimal solution on target. Um, uh, obviously, under under some more additional assumption, how much data and things like that. Okay, so in this label shift setup, the goals are twofold. One is we want to estimate the target label marginal PT of Y, which is class proportions of like different classes in my target and label data, and at the same time also adapt a classifier that we may have trained on source data to sort of target data. And note that this problem is non-trivial because we don't see target labels. Okay, um, yeah. If there's any question about label shift setup, uh, uh, please feel free to interrupt. Um, okay, so now I'll sort of probably like motivate how this sample setting can be solved. And then I'll sort of generalize the setting in, in the next few slides. So, so in this simple setting, uh, let's let's look at what the target marginal over your unlabeled inputs look like. So your PT of X can be rewritten as PT of Y equal to I times PT of X given Y equal to I. And because we have this assumption that your class conditional X given Y doesn't change, you can say that PT of, uh, 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 PT of, uh, uh, X given Y is same as PS of X given Y. I think there's some question on chat. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be monitoring chat, so please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I don't have multiple screens. I'll have to uh, uh, switch. Um, I can relay this one or Ishan yeah. can speak out loud. Um, so Ishan is asking, class prevalence change may also depend on time in a given location. By this yeah. shift, do we consider only change in class prevalence or uh, other change, or other changes? For example, changes in X-ray equipment? In yeah, so we'll, we'll come to that. So we'll come to that. So we'll sort of, we are starting from a simple problem where we are just considering sort of class prevalence changes. But in the next few slides, I'll introduce this problem of relaxed label shift. We will sort of start introducing some additional changes which are a bit more natural looking. Yeah, so I think someone has correctly answered that these changes are not really allowed at this point because we have assumed that P of X given Y is sort of fixed. I, I'm just sort of presenting the setting to sort of motivate like how, how these settings are being solved and then, then we'll sort of generalize. Okay, so, so here the unknown is our label marginal PT of Y. And we can imagine that PT of X is in some sense known as we have unlabeled data from let's say target and we know PS of X given Y because we have labeled data from source. I'm right now assuming some population access, but we have sort of finite sample counterparts to these. This is just to sort of motivate the way in which we, we arrive at the solution. So now the only thing that is unknown in this equation is actually the target label margin. So what we can hope for is we can hope to minimize some divergence between LHS and RHS. And by minimizing the divergence, we'll hope to get a solution which will be sort of an approximation to the target label margin. Now I'm not going into the details of how do we deal with approximations and what divergences are useful to use, uh, are, are useful here, but we have effective techniques that are sort of applicable in deep learning regimes. That is when we have finite data from source 
and finite data from target, which is unlabeled. We have actually one over square root n optimal methods to estimate the target label marginal. And these methods are in some sense minimax optimal that have been proved in some of uh, more recent books. And once we have these estimates of target label marginal, we can hope to simply update the source classifier by doing a post hoc reweighting of softmax predictions. That is, if we have softmax prediction, let's say given by this vector fsx uh, indexed by a class y, then we can hope to multiply these softmax predictions by importance weight pt of y divided by ps of y. And this will sort of recalibrate it to the new target margin. <clears throat> and in some sense, in this setting, these kinds of solutions sort of achieve uh, near optimal, like, 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 yeah, like they're, they're close to like, like an optimal Oracle baseline, which where we have target data. So, so in some sense, these problems, have, uh, we have sort of made good progress on these problems. Uh, yeah, if there's any question about, about like, like this, this high level intuition on the kind of solution for label shift problem, please uh, let me know. Okay. Uh, so now let's come back and sort of address the questions about along with time, things like your image resolution or your medical imaging can, techniques can change. And this is exactly now we are sort of planning to address. So in label shift, we have sort of two key assumptions. One is we assume that the class over, that, 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 that the classes that we may see in target should always appear in source. That is your uh, label set is restricted to the source label set and your P of X given Y doesn't change. These assumptions can, as I sort of mentioned in chat, can be violated in practice. <clears throat> and in this talk, we'll sort of focus on relaxing the latter assumption. That is the assumption that P of X given Y remains sort of invariant. We have some prior work that sort of deals with the class overlap assumption. And I'll not go into the details of that, but I have quick references if, if, if someone is interested, or I'm happy to chat about these at the end of the talk, if, if you are interested in that. But, but in this talk, we'll now sort of start relaxing this assumption that P of X given Y remains invariant. So, okay. So, and, and the motivation is exactly as, as someone suggested, which is like, when we have hospital data, if we go and collect data in real world, what I'm trying to show here is across different hospitals, the pixel intensity sort of differ. And at the same time, the class prevalences are different. So in the top histogram, what we have is per pixel intensity averaged over all classes on label data. And in the bottom plot, what we have is simple histogram over four classes in that, in that, uh, uh, in that uh, training data from different hospitals. And what we see is both of these things are simultaneously changed. So this motivates this relaxed label shift problem where um, we're now interested in tackling both simultaneously. So, so again, let me sort of introduce the relaxed label shift setup a bit more formally. So here we'll assume that label distributions can shift from source to target arbitrarily, but the target labels will be within source labels. And your P of X given Y now varies in some natural ways and in some comparatively restrictive way where we restrict the divergence between uh, your uh, source class conditional and target con class conditional by some epsilon. Uh, and I'll get to some theoretical results towards the end. But right now, to sort of uh, uh, to, to, to <clears throat> instantiate these divergences, we'll focus on uh, real world applications and like data sets that have actually been collected in the real world, which sort of show some uh, uh, where, 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 these, where these divergences sort of naturally appear. Uh, I think there's some more question in chat. Uh, uh, by X, uh, okay. Uh, no worries. Uh, by X given Y is fixed. Do you mean that the way X is captured also fixed? Let's say we use a different sensor to capture similar image, but the sensor has some different. Exactly. So now when we are shifting P of X given Y, now we are allowing for, now we are allowing to use different sensors because these different sensors will have different characteristic for same class of images in some sense. So now by allowing for like these shifts, um, we are allowing to, for example, using like different sensors now. And I'll, I, and, and I'll get to the next slide where I'll now introduce uh, uh, how, how, how we characterize these settings in like, in like with, with some 
uh, empirical examples. Okay, the goal again here in this relaxed label shift problem is to one, estimate the target label marginal, and two, to adapt your source classifier to target data. So the goals here remain the same as sort of the, the label shift problem. Okay, so, so <clears throat> now I'll sort of introduce uh, this, this problem of like, like relaxed label shift with, with, with some examples. So here, your P of X given Y can shift in seemingly natural ways. So on the left, we show some standard benchmarks and domain adaptation, where from training to test domains, uh, your images change due to some natural perturbation. So for example, in Chameleon, these changes are due to using different pigmentation techniques. In civil comments, they are changing due to data collected across different localities and things like that. However, in most of these existing benchmarks, label proportions stay the same. That is, even when we have access to unlabeled test data, label proportions in that unlabeled test data is almost close to or similar to what we have in your labeled training data. This can be problematic because as we do sort of hill climbing on these benchmarks, our, our algorithms that we develop may often get tied to this assumption. And more broadly, these assumptions may be violated in practice and we don't know whether we can still continue to use such methods or not. And hence motivated, we introduce first a benchmark, which we call as RLS bench, where along with some natural looking shifts in P of X given Y, your class proportions may also shift. That is, for example, in this patch chameleon example, along with shifting your pigmentation techniques or the techniques that you use to collect these cell images, your proportions of different classes for those cell images may also change. And sort of this motivates this, this RLS bench problem here. Uh, if there's any question uh, now about the setup or like the, the kinds of restrictions that we are allowing, please let me know. Okay, um, uh, yeah, so as sort of described, uh, we introduced this large scale benchmark where we have more than 500 distribution shift pairs with sort of varying severity of shift in target class proportions across uh, 14 different multi-domain data sets. And, and, and to sort of understand where we are in terms of handling these relaxed label shift problems, we evaluate like 12 popular DA methods based on domain invariant representation learning, self-training and test time adaptation methods. And, and we train sort of large number of models to get to the conclusions that I'm about to describe next. Uh, yeah, but, but this is sort of a single slide that sort of uh, uh, lists down the data sets that we have in different modalities. So we consider vision, language and tabular modalities where most of these data sets are motivated by scientific applications. And in each of these data sets, we have multiple domains, like multiple source and target domains, uh, which present some form of natural shifts in P of X given by. Uh, 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 yes, uh, I think, uh, yeah, we did train. So, so the thing is, uh, we have more than like 500 different distribution shift pairs and we are training sort of 12 different methods and we do ablation over differences. So we have really trained like a large number of models. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so across these sort of 12 data sets, we have like 56 source to target pairs, but note that in these distribution shift pairs, we have limited to no class prevalence shift. And this is mainly because when these data sets were collected, they were very particular about how to get unlabeled target data. Like they were very careful about balancing it and then throwing away the labels. So we'll now reverse the process. What we will do, uh, uh, um, yeah, this is like just a sample of uh, five of these data sets, uh, which where I'm showing like what are the different domains looking like. So for FMOW, we have shifts over time. For Chameleon, we have shifts over hospitals. And for uh, NTD 13, we have shifts over like, like different entities. So for example, in your training data, you can have dog categories as a golden retriever, but in your test data, you'll have categories as Pomeranian and things like that. Uh, okay. So now we'll reverse the, the, the correction procedure 
which people use to balance out the unlabeled test data. So in principle, because we have labels for this unlabeled data, we'll simulate your target label marginal by sampling from a Dirchlet distribution. And what this Dirchlet distribution will do is as we sort of vary the, the parameter for this Dirchlet distribution, it will make the target label distribution a bit more long tail. So as we are decreasing sort of alpha here, the target distribution will become long tailed. And what do we do? We sample target marginals from different Dirchlet priors, like different values of alpha, and sort of get different CVRTs of target label marginal shifts. And intuitively, as sort of alpha decreases, the severity of label proportion shift sort of increases. <clears throat> and hence, in our setup, we do sort of take a cross product over shifts in P of X given Y and shifts in target label marginals to get to like multiple different uh, source target pairs. So we'll keep the source as fixed and we'll vary the target by taking a cross product over shifts in P of X given Y and shifts in your label marginal. Please let me know if there is any question in, in like, like the, the RLS pen set up uh, at this point. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, so there has been some work that in in in, in prior that, that that has tried to sort of tackle these the Dirac's label shift problems. However, it is very difficult to like assess the state of the field due to due to like different inconsistencies among different papers. So they use like different evaluation criteria. For example, some will care about per class average performance on target data instead of actual target performance, so like according to the class prevalences that you have. And then there are different data sets and often comparisons across different papers are missing or like different baselines are missing. So this, this literature, while started to realize this problem, it's, it's a bit haphazard and, and spread out across different papers. And it's unclear uh, how to even do like model selection in these problems because we fundamentally only see unlabeled data. And there have been papers that peek into target performance, which makes us question whether those improvements will actually transfer to practice. So in some sense, we tried to sort of perform some fair and realistic comparisons by varying, uh, by, by sort of standardizing all of these different axes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so just to sort of quickly flash different methods that we use, these are the methods that are sort of broadly characterized into four settings. And I'll maybe like quickly go over these. So these source-only models are models that are trained on your uh, only labeled training data, and it sort of does not look at your target unlabeled data at all. And then there are these methods that use unlabeled data in different manners, either by, by doing some domain alignment or either using pseudo labels, which are these self-training methods, or these test time training methods, which, which do a mixture of these. Um, okay, and yeah, quickly, I'll quickly over go, go over this slide, which is like, uh, we have been very careful about how do we do model selection and how we are standardized across different architectures and uh, different methods in our benchmark. We have been very careful about it and we have more details about how we do these uh, in the paper. Uh, so let me quickly jump to the results. So, uh, but yeah, if there's any question at this point, uh, please let me know. It's sort of one quick question about like the, the accuracy definition, right? Like uh, depending on the DA method that's used, right? Like, yeah. uh, and, and the sample images that it's been or, or a subset of say hospital images, um, how would you go about defining accuracy? So, so yeah, in some sense, for example, if I go back to like the archetype example that we had, more likely than not, if you are interested in, let's say performance on the target data, then you can just look at if you had labels, how would your performance look like, right? Like, so for example, just performance on your unlabeled target data, like not doing any normalization or post hoc balancing for your last labels, right? Like you can just go ahead with the actual label proportions in your target data. So for example, here in this example, you would want to have a model that does very good on asthma class, 
right? So for example, like here, we'll just sort of compute average performance on your uh, on your target uh, domain, which which respects this class prevalence. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, let, let me come back to like the, the first finding. Um, yeah, so before, yeah, I'll quickly sort of discuss how to read this plot. So on the x-axis in this plot, we'll have varying alphas. And as we go towards the right, the label shift severity will sort of increase. And on y-axis, we have relative performance where the performance is relative to a source only model. So we have rescaled the performances by subtracting performance of source only model so that it lies on zero. So if we are better than X, like, like, like this, this uh, Y equal to zero line, then we are better by using a domain adaptation method. And if we are below this Y equal to zero line, then we are doing actually worse by using your unlabeled target data. So that's the way in which we read the plot. And the, the standard deviation or the boxes basically denote aggregation over different data sets and different shifts. So for example, a single bar in this will denote sort of a fixed alpha, but then average taken over different uh, uh, data sets. So for example, FMOW, Chameleon, and things like that. So what we observe here is as the severity of label proportion shift sort of increases, as we are moving towards the right, the performance of these models starts going below the performance of a source only model. That is, if there was no label proportion shift, we may get benefited by using these methods. But if we are on the right side of the setting, that is when we have sort of severe proportion, label proportion shifts, we are actually worse off by doing uh, domain adaptation, specifically by these three techniques. That is, yeah, we have sort of gone worse uh, with respect to like a source only baseline, which is denoted by the dotted black line. And we show that these results are not just limited to those three methods, but they're actually more widespread. So they are present in different uh, methods like Dan, fixed match, and to some extent, noisy student. Sorry, just, just about, sorry. In this case, yeah. are you only changing, there's only shifts in the target label proportion or? So, so both of these shifts are happening, right? So, so for example, if you pick, let's say one bar, for example, let's say at none, which, in, which, which is alpha equal to infinity, then there the shifts are these different domains that we just discussed, right? So, so for example, if, you, if I go back to this plot, the shifts are happening in this way. So we'll have shifts in P of X given Y, which are like these different uh, shifts, for example, C far 10 P2, C far 10 C frost, pixel eight and such and things like that. And as we are going on your X axis, we are sort of going across the bottom plot here, which is we are changing the label proportion shift, but each bar takes an average across different shifts in P of X given Y. So it's not just label proportion shift. I'm just plotting it across label proportion shifts on the X axis. Does that answer the question? Yes, but basically you have a difference in all of them. Yeah, I get it. Exactly, yes. exactly. Yes, yes. And we have aggregation across the different axes in the paper. So yeah, this is just for highlighting like the, the main results. So that's why we also probably have these bar and probably like some outliers because these are actually averages across like 500 different uh, or like I think uh, some hundred different distribution shifts for each of these bar blocks. Uh, and the solid line sort of denotes the mean and the bar plot already includes sort of uh, the, the medians in each of these. Okay, so um, so, so we, we see that almost all existing methods start sort of faltering when we have severe target proportion shifts. <clears throat> so this brings us into this question of, okay, how can we sort of start? Uh, and, and, and yeah, this is, this is problematic because uh, in practice, when we are deploying these models, we may not know whether, whether we are in the right side of the plot or in the left side of the plot. We may not know what is actually the target proportions in your unlabeled data. So, okay, so we've highlighted this failure. Now we'll also sort of introduce, uh, uh, introduce uh, 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 some simple baselines that sort of start tackling this problem. So this is something that we call a sort of a meta algorithm because here we have two simple general purpose steps 
that you can plug in with any domain adaptation method of your choice. So let me introduce these corrections. So the first is this resampling based correction, where what do we do? We balance our source data and we leverage pseudo labels on the target data to perform pseudo class balance resampling. Let me explain it with this plot. So we have our unlabeled target data, which is denoted by XT. And let's say model at iterate at epoch or at iterate t is denoted by FT. What we will do, we'll pseudo label these unlabeled target examples with model FT. And then we will imagine that these pseudo labels y hat t are actually some surrogate to true labels and we'll resample the data to balance it out to let's say uniform class proportions. So now we'll have some class balanced, like some pseudo class balanced data, which is denoted by this XT, uh, XT twiddle. And we'll do same thing on your labeled source data. And then we'll use the DA algorithm of your choice and train for let's say one epoch or one iteration. And then we'll repeat the process. So now FT will become FT plus one. We'll pseudo label the target data again and we'll do this class balance resampling. So this is this resampling step where we'll start from scratch and continue to do the sampling till we are sort of, till some stopping, early stopping criteria meets. Does that resampling correction uh, makes sense? <clears throat> Okay. Even so, so this correction is inspired by, by one related work that, that came recently, which is this century. Now note that with this resampling technique, in an ideal scenario, we can hope to train our classifier on a mixture of balanced source data and balanced target data. That is, if we ideally, if we if we do this resampling step perfectly, we'll still train a model that is trained on let's say some class balance of source and target, which is let's say fixed. And in our case, we fix it to a uniform distribution. This still leaves open the gap of adapting your classifier F to your original target proportion. So recall your original target proportion was still something else, but what we did here was we balanced it to some predefined class proportion, let's say uniform. So this motivates us to the next step which is now we estimate our target label marginal with existing label shift estimations methods that I was briefly discussing in the beginning. That is, we have our unlabeled target data, we have your labeled source data, and we hope to leverage these existing methods to sort of estimate the label proportion. And then once we have this estimated label proportion, which, it, which is denoted by P hat of Y sub T, we can use that to perform a reweighting on your soft max predictions. That is, you take your classifier trained with your domain adaptation method of choice. You use that classifier to perform some target label marginal estimation, which uses unlabeled test data and labeled source data. It spits out a label proportion estimate. And then we use that label proportion estimate to recalibrate your soft max predictions. And this gives you the final classifier, which we have denoted by F prime T. Okay, so these are the two corrections. One is this resampling based correction and the other is this reweighting based correction. Now we employ these corrections one by one on top of existing DA methods. And what do we see? We observe that existing DA methods improve by using these techniques alone and both of these techniques together sort of provide some huge improvements, specifically in the extreme label shift setting. So you can see on the right side of the plot, while this blue bar is the original bar of the Dan method without any of these corrections. So this blue bar is copied from, let's say the previous plot. Now we add these resampling and reweighting based corrections denoted by R, S and RW respectively. And this RS plus RW is basically doing both of these in a sequential manner, which is denoted by the red curve here. And we see that in some sense, it helps uh, this Dan and it also helps more broadly. So we have implemented this method on top of all existing algorithms and we show that we can improve all of these uh, uh, to some extent. <clears throat> if there's any question with respect to this result, uh, please uh, let me know.
otherwise i'll jump to uh, some concluding slides and maybe some quick next thoughts so uh, post hoc rewriting uh, you mean you don't need to learn the the weight just use you, you you use the use the formulation to get the to get the weight determine exactly yeah to get the target label marginal and then use it to simply like multiply our softmax outputs okay we have more results on like how exactly this is principled under label shift settings in the in the paper and i'm very happy to chat about it uh, 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 if you want any more uh, elaborations okay and here we also have like a quick takeaway which basically sort of highlights that there is no like one fit for all method so if we group results by different modalities we see that one our resampling and reweighting base correction always helps and two across different modalities different methods sort of lead the bar here in the sense that for example on vision data sets what we observe is that fix match which is like the self training technique with our resampling plus reweighting corrections on an average performs the best but on language and tabular data sets other techniques for example on language actually doing no adaptation helps just take your source model and do the reweighting that we proposed for tabular data sets we observe that c land probably does the best so so this is another nuance finding which shows that definitely there is no one fit for all da method but in some sense our reweighting and resampling procedures in general help across different modalities and different shifts uh, okay and one more sort of interesting finding is that these methods that that sort of uh people have proposed in prior so specifically sentry iw sedan and iw dan so these are like prior methods our post hoc corrections actually do much better than these methods that previously have been proposed to tackle specifically this relaxed label shift problem i'll not go into details of a lot of these results but at a high level what we are trying to sort of discuss here is that sort of by creating this benchmark and by carefully thinking about the early stopping criteria and things like that we observe that those methods actually do not really provide significant benefits and suffer the same failure modes that the corresponding base algorithms did so for example sentry proposed some specific changes on top of fix match and iw dan and iw sedan proposed some changes on the base dan and sedan whereas our techniques which are like a bit more general purpose they they sort of seem to improve uh, on top of these existing uh, methods okay so yeah i'll i'll sort of quickly so for for interested audience into like re, into understanding what do we mean by some natural perturbations on p of x q and y we have started to sort of develop some theoretical intuitions and let me sort of quickly discuss one result which is we can now sort of characterize how our label proportion shift estimates will vary as you sort of start introducing shifts in p of x given by so here on the left side uh, uh so here on the left side we have our error in estimating your target proportions so w star is the true uh, proportion and w hat is let's say the estimated proportion what we are sort of trying to show here is that these estimates will degrade gracefully as your p of x given y shifts so the error in your estimates of target label proportions degrade gracefully as the shift severity in your p of x given y increases <clears throat> okay so um yeah if there is any question here uh, uh please uh, let me know otherwise i'll quickly jump to some concluding remarks <clears throat> okay so 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 bringing back this question of okay why one should think about these relaxed label shift problems and why one should use like our our, our benchmark that we create on top of existing domain adaptation data sets the main reason is we only observe one label target data and hence label proportions may shift so the hope here is that by creating this sort of a benchmark we bring this benchmark driven literature to sort of one step closer to the kinds of diversity that we may hope to or we may expect to encounter when we are deploying these models in the wild 
and 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 sort of related to like this this benchmark driven literature we we believe that rls bench provides sort of a more comprehensive and a standardized suite of of data sets um and our baseline algorithm is just like a like a like a simple simple uh, plugin of of existing methods proposed for label shift it definitely calls for more future work in these relaxed label shift scenarios yeah i think probably uh, uh, how much uh, yeah depending on questions uh, uh, yeah i can probably present a few more slides but yeah i think this is a good stopping point and probably take some questions uh, if you have Uh, so I have one one more question. Yeah, please. Uh, so for the basic setting of label shifting, um, based on my understanding, uh, one 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 example is 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 like for the source data. Uh, for, assume source data is balanced. I mm. mean the the label the label distribution is is balanced, and the target target in the target domain the um, label distribution might not be balanced. That's yep. the, that's the that's the difference between label shifting and the traditional domain adaptation. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And 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 because we only observe one label target data, we may not know whether such a shift has happened or not, right? Like that's the yes. more important problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I had like a couple of more slides for some of the work that we did now, but yeah, I think uh, uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. And if we have time, I can probably uh, go over like some more recent works that we have. But yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know, Rosan. Do we have like five minutes or? Um, um... Yeah, we have um, till <clears throat> the hour, but we can also stay longer. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, probably I'll I'll take like a minute here to see if there's any question. Otherwise, I'll quickly discuss uh, some more implications that we have. Uh, yeah. We use test X. Is an example, the most commonly used data set is this. There are 14 conditions. What would be a theoretical recommendation? Yeah, so I think we are doing some more experiments on like chest expert and these test x-ray data sets. And we have some interesting findings. And actually a one-liner summary that I would recommend here is they are like multi-label label shift problems. So in some sense, our algorithms do directly port over if you think about one versus all classification problems. And we actually have some positive results where we show that the findings that we have in RLS bench also sort of extends to multi-label problems. So yeah, this paper is still not yet out, but this is a great question. And I think uh, uh, like one liner takeaway for these practitioners would be to think about one versus all problems and then use something like RLS bench to start tackling that problem. Uh, when you do the um, reweighting, yeah. am I right to think that you don't have to retrain the model then? Yes. But yes. You don't, you don't retrain it, right? Yeah. But then when no, you do you resampling, don't. you do. Exactly. So it's basically so reweighting is like a free correction that you can do after you have trained your resample models, right? So this resample model is like an iterative technique where you will continue sort of train, you'll continue your training, and once you have met some early stopping criteria. You can simply apply this single step correction technique and you'll get the FT model that you have early stopped to FT prime, which is now the rebated model. But you also tested only reweighting, right? So you. you yes. So you, yes. So, yeah. And you, sh you actually have shown that in some cases that is actually enough, right? To yes, 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 yes. Yes. Yeah, so there now the base model. So when we only say reweighting, we are doing rebating on top of the base model. So imagine we are not doing any resampling. We are taking the non model that is just the base model, for example, Dan. And then we are doing a post hoc rebating with estimated label margin, which is denoted by the gray point here. Okay. Uh, but yeah. I, uh, uh, yeah, there are like I'm going in ordering. So other methods like GPM often used for tabular data. Is there any guess about applicability to non-DNN techniques? Yeah, that's a that's a great point, right? So so in some sense, any method that sort of tries to take unlabeled data and labeled data and sort of spits out a model 
you can hope to convert our findings into like a two stage technique which is you'll take you let's say train a model with let's say gbm and then you'll get uh, some model you can use that model to pseudo balance your target data and then you can further train like a new gbm model which now will be like a resample like like model that is trained on that resample data and now you can perform your reweighting on top if you want to or not so in some sense the the, the meta algorithm that we develop is actually a bit more generally applicable even to like non dnn techniques uh yeah i think there is one more question uh, which general purpose corrections besides resampling will be more effective for improving da per yeah so one more finding that we have that i was sort of trying to quickly discuss from this plot is if we have vision modalities and in particular you can check for plots like these on each of these data sets individually on the paper we have observed that self training is actually very good and that question actually segues to a small portion of like a teaser that i wanted to cover so so yeah if there is no other question i'll go on a bit more into i think uh, shantanu's question about which are other more general purpose techniques than resampling and reweighting uh, so i'll go into that but yeah if there is uh, any other question uh, please uh, let me know okay if not then let me actually quickly flash one more result that sort of also answers that question so this is a paper under submission so okay one finding from rls bench which is in some sense a positive take away for da community is that we can hope that we can like sort of use the meta algorithm that we sort of proposed in this and use techniques that people are proposing for domain adaptation under only covariate shift and then transfer those improvements to relaxed label shift scenarios like that is in fact what we have observed as sort of one positive finding for the da community which brings us to this question of assume that there is no label shift how should we perform adaptation when we have target and label data that is we only have some natural looking covariate shifts in your uh so for example you are going from let's say uh, medical sensor 1 to medical sensor 2 and things like that and and you know that label proportions have not shifted let's say someone tells you that then how should you do domain adaptation so for this two prominent techniques have been developed in like last 4 5 years one is the self training kind of method where people try to do pseudo labeling of their unlabeled target data and then overfit to those pseudo labels so that is this fixed match technique that you could see on the on the on the on the plots previously which was doing the best on vision modality and there's one more technique that people have developed more recently which is this contrastive learning for example sim clear swav or like barlow twins in some sense which are sort of emerged as sort of leading techniques for incorporating this unlabeled data into into uh, these domain adaptation kinds of settings where we have now labeled source data and unlabeled target data and we can hope to do either self training where you will train your model on labeled source data make some pseudo labels on your unlabeled target data and then overfit to those and in your contrastive learning setting what you will do is you will take your unlabeled data from target and your unlabeled data from source learn some representations and then fine tune only with source labeled data like people have independently seen that both of these techniques help a lot so natural question that we ask here is are these techniques doing anything complementary or in some sense can benefits of these two techniques be combined in any way and to our surprise a little to no work has been done either empirically or theoretically in trying to combine these two existing techniques like one is this self training which is like this pseudo based labeling based technique and other is this representation learning with with contrast losses and we have a very surprising finding in this recent paper so we employ these two techniques one is self training and the other is contrastive learning and we do something called self training on top of contrastive learning which is this talk and we perform experiments in two kinds of settings one is your ssl which is semi supervised learning settings where the distribution between your unlabeled data and labeled data is the same there is literally no distribution the only problem here is you have smaller amount of labeled training data and in those settings we observe that doing self training on top of contrastive learning provides no significant difference like provides maybe minor improvements 
on the other hand if we are in this domain adaptation setting where there is a huge distribution shift in your unlabeled data from your labeled data we see that self training can actually improve significantly on top of contrast alert that is learn your representations on union of labeled and unlabeled uh, on your unlabeled source and unlabeled target data and then instead of fine tuning you perform self training with these learned representations where you use the same unlabeled target data again and we see that across most of these data sets in rls bench where we restrict to no label shift settings we see sort of huge improvements so this is sort of one finding that sort of uh, now goes back and sort of tries to answer that at least in these vision modalities where people have explored contrast learning and self training as independently successful techniques we can hope to actually combine them and maybe get some more general purpose techniques for adaptation in 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 presence of only like covariate shift when we know label proportions has now have not shifted <clears throat> okay we have some more theoretical understanding on why this happens but yeah uh, if you are around in icml we'll be presenting this paper in workshop and 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 and, and hopefully the, the 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 longer paper will be out on archive soon but yeah uh, intuitively um, i think i think the, the, the finding is that um, while we can learn good representations with contrast learning self training helps you to learn transferable representations by 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 improving your linear layer learned on top like that sort of a simple one liner finding uh, that we have by understanding why this happens but yeah uh, yeah sorry i think i did overrun by a few minutes but yeah if there is any question uh, uh, please uh, let me know on the new set of results as well We're well within time. Do you have any okay. more questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, yeah, I should probably thank, yeah, thank Roseanne for inviting me. I hope uh, this talk was, uh, yeah, like, like people found, uh, these results interesting and then they get some idea of about like how people like how like this domain adaptation literature is sort of progressing and and maybe what are like good methods to try at this point yeah thank you for coming and enjoy your time in hawaii yeah thank you cool. thanks everyone <laughs>